chapter 15, where, where we are going to be spending some time this morning. As we are all aware, this past Tuesday morning, very early in the morning, we had a tragedy in our state, in our city. It was about 1.30 in the morning, and there was a container ship that left the port of Baltimore. And sadly, it struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which led to that bridge collapsing, falling there in the bay. That bridge was an icon, a part of the Baltimore skyline. I have many friends who used to every day, they would travel that bridge going either to work, back and forth. I'm sure many of us have been on that bridge. Maybe for some of you, it's been countless amount of times. Well, sadly, there were people on that bridge when it collapsed, and I started thinking through what could have been happening. There were people that were on that bridge, maybe, perhaps, they were leaving early in the morning to start spring break. Maybe they're heading south or north to start a spring break trip. Maybe there are people that were heading home from a long days of work. Maybe friends got together to watch a movie. They watched a late night movie and they were heading back home to relax, to go to bed for the night. Maybe there are people, I know there are people even working there on the bridge at that time. And as you think of those who passed away, sadly, they had no clue when they woke up that morning, they had no clue that that would be their last day on earth. They had no idea. It would be their last day here on earth. What a horrible, sad tragedy. But also, for us, it is a reminder of how short life really is. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the first part of that verse, it says, is an, it is appointed man, that man die once. Psalms 89, 45 says, what man can live and not see death or save himself from the power of of the grave. Ladies and gentlemen, we will all go through the valley of the shadow of death sooner or later. You're sitting around people who have battled that recently with family, friends, spouses, and beyond. But when that moment comes for us individually, when that moment comes for you, you we have to ask the question, what happens at that moment? When you and I take our last breath, what happens? What are we going to find after death? Ever thought about that? What happens to us after we die? What happens to us after our last breath? And so what we do, we look for advice. Maybe we talk to friends, we talk to family, then we start looking up religious sources, and then we say, okay, where are some religious answers for this question? And we start looking, is there any religious leaders I can answer the question? Are there any who have been through it who are still alive today? And we're here to tell you there's been one. And ladies and gentlemen, his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Revelation 1, 18. Jesus is talking and he declares these words. He says, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And he says, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a man by the name of Buddha. Well, Buddha is dead. There's a man by the name of Muhammad. Well, Muhammad is dead. There's a man by the name of Joseph Smith. Well, Joseph Smith is dead, but there's a man by the name of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is alive. It's interesting. It says he holds the keys. In our world, keys are important, aren't they? Most of you have keys in your pocket right now, and if you don't, this is a reminder that there's probably in, you left your keys in your car. If they are not in your pocket right now, you have keys, and on those keys, you have maybe a car key, maybe a house key. If you would try to go to my house today, you'll find the doors are locked. You need a key to get legally get into my house. If you have a key to something, that is authority. Whoever has a key, you have authority to open that door, authority to go into that car or that house. You and I, we do not, we don't have the authority, we don't have the keys to death, we don't have the keys to heaven or hell, but we know the one who does, and his name 
is Jesus. And that's what today is all about. That's what Easter is about. That's what Resurrection Sunday is about. It's not about plastic eggs as much fun as we've had with Easter egg hunts and our scavenger hunt. What a great idea. What an amazing thing we got to do this year to love on our community and have Easter egg hunts and throughout the community. I hope you enjoyed that. Some of you later today with your families, you're going to have a little mini Easter egg hunt. It's going to be so much fun. You're going to enjoy that. Maybe you're going to eat peeps. Now, I don't know who eats peeps anymore. Maybe that's your thing. That's not my thing. But ladies and gentlemen, as much as you enjoy those things, that's not what it's about. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You'll notice we have a beautiful cross here, but there's no one on it because he's risen from the dead. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ was put to death. Physically, medically, he was dead. His heart had stopped beating. His brains stopped waving. But then, then he was risen from the dead. It's the greatest event moment of all time. And I tried to come up with a list of things that could even compare, like World Series, Super Bowl. You know, I'm trying to think of something that can compare, but I feel like it's a horrible comparison. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing compares. Nothing can compare. I, I'm trying to think of something. Nothing compares to the price that was paid on the cross. Nothing compares to the fact that there's an empty tomb this morning. It's bigger than all of them. It's bigger than everything. So a question that people ask me, maybe you get this question too, is what's the big deal? What's the big deal? If Jesus really is alive or not, how does that affect me today, 2,000 years after it happened? How does that affect us? Maybe you had that question. Which, by the way, it's a great question. It's such a good question. It was actually asked in the Bible. They're in the city of Corinth, which, by the way, there's a book of First and Second Corinthians that's written to the people from the city of Corinth, and Paul writes that letter. And it's a question that we're going to go through. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 12, or 15, 12 to 19, sorry. And here we're going to see, these people are going to wonder, what, what is so important? What is a big, such a big deal? about the resurrection. Well, let's see what Paul says. Beginning in verse 12, Paul says this. He says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Obviously, people were saying that. He says, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, and Christ has not been raised either, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have been who have fallen asleep in Christ, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. If that doesn't put in perspective, I don't have much to say that will. It's all about the resurrection. The apostle Paul is talking, he's saying this is about 20, maybe I think it's exactly about 24 years after Jesus died, rose again, and went to heaven. 24 years later, Paul is reminding the church in the city of Corinth. He's saying it's the resurrection of Jesus that holds it all together. Sure, his supernatural birth, we celebrated a few months ago at Christmas, right? Sure, that's an amazing moment where the divinity became humanity for us. But this moment is why he came to earth, to pay the price for you, to pay the price for me. Everything hinges here. Have you ever noticed how where everything hinges, people attack that? You ever notice that? And that's what we see in our world today. Skeptics are doing anything, everything to prove the Bible wrong, to prove the resurrection wrong. And so what we're going to do this moment, this morning, I'm sorry, we'll take a few moments and look at some of the more popular attacks, if I can use that word on the resurrection. Things that maybe the skeptics say, maybe somebody here has one of these views, and maybe through today you can understand why we stand so firm on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. There's a New York Times article. The New York Times article puts it this way. 
So shortly after Jesus was executed, his followers were suddenly galvanized. That's a fancy word to say, changed. They were changed from a baffled and cowering group into people whose message about a living Jesus and a coming kingdom. They preach at the risk of their lives, eventually change an empire. And then it closes by saying something happened, but exactly what? Something has happened, but exactly what? Now, one of the attacks that people put on Jesus and the resurrection is this. Maybe Jesus didn't really die on the cross. You ever heard this one before? Maybe Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Now, he was there. He was beaten. He hung there, but he never fully died. They got him down from the cross before he was dead. Maybe you've heard this one before. Well, the problem, if you hold this view, is that in every account that I read, Jewish, Roman, believer, non-believer, every account affirms that Jesus Christ was dead. A few weeks ago, if you were here, we talked about Pilate. Remember we talked about Pilate a few moments ago, a few weeks ago. Pilate, a non-believer, says the same thing. He verifies that Jesus was dead. Many other reputable historians, men by the name of Lucian, another man by the name of Josephus, which by the way, if you were here Friday, you saw Michael doing a great job portraying him. But these are reputable historians that all say Jesus' death was factual. And of course there's more, we're just kind of scratching the surface of this. But there are people we know that say, nah, he wasn't really dead. Don't believe that lie. My Savior died for me. He died for us. But if they don't like that one, they usually jump to this one. They say, well, his body was probably stolen. Somebody probably stole the body of Jesus. Could it be that the disciples faked the resurrection and then stole the body of Jesus when no one was looking? Well, a few problems with this one is the tomb was guarded not with one person, but two people at all times, 24 hours a day. They had two people guarding the tomb. And here's the best one. There was never a body found. There was never a body found. The body of Jesus is never found. Now, that you know why? That's because we know where it is. We know exactly where the body of Jesus is. All that we find is a stone that has been rolled away, and then we find disciples that for some reason, they were acting like cowards. I know that's a heavy term there. When, they, when, when Jesus was arrested and hands behind his back, and Judas kisses his cheek, the disciples scatter, worried about their own lives, worried about themselves. What's going to happen to me? They got my fault. They got my Savior. Now, now I have to worry about me. So worried about themselves, they scatter. Well, now that Jesus is back, they're not scared anymore. They're not worried anymore. Now they're bold. Why? Now they're courageous. Why? So it's impossible for the body of Jesus to have been stolen. Another one people say is maybe it never happened. Maybe it just never happened. Uh, You know, there's such thing called a legend. It never even happened. You ever heard of the game called Telephone? You ever play telephone? As a youth pastor, it's a, it's a, it's a staple. You, you tell the person here, you, make, you tell them a phrase, and they tell this person, who tells this person, who, and it goes all the way down. And what's supposed to happen is they're supposed to say the same phrase to every person. But if you ever played, you know that, I don't think it's ever happened. It, it, like, I don't think it ever has. Where it gets all the way down, and, and this person yells out the phrase, and everyone else is like, what in the world? You know, and everybody's like, how did you get to that? It never happens. And so that's what they say happened here. That the story changes and changes and changes until you got what we have today. Well, here's the problem with that lie, because that's what that is, by the way. Here's the problem with that lie. You see, the story never changes. Secular, and I use that word on perfect purpose, secular historian say the same story, and it's never changed. Gospel writers, all four independently, write the same story. It's always the same. The truth never changed. So it's not a legend. It's true. And let me add this. If the disciples were trying to cover it up, 
Who were, does anybody remember who was the first ones there at the cross? It was the women, weren't there? Remember that? They said, they woke up early in the morning. They have their spices. They're going to go embalm Jesus. And they're talking pleasantries. And, and they're like, oh, wait a second. Who's going who's gonna to move the stone? And of course, they get their stones moved and, you know, the world has changed. But back then, now thank goodness not today, but back then, women's lives were not viewed the same as they are today. They were devalued. They weren't seen as men were seen back then. So if you're going to try to put a lie together, you wouldn't send women, you would send men back then. So again, it just proves that, like, it, the Bible is definitely true, or you would have seen men go, not women first. Which, by the way, not just those two, more than 500 people. In those 40 days, from when Jesus rose from the dead to when he went to heaven, in those 40 days, more than 500 people saw Jesus alive. 500 people ate with him, talked with him, listened to him, saw the holes in his hands, in his feet, in his side. Laughed with him. Maybe just heard him preach. We're there with him. More than 500 people. How is it possible that 500 people are all believing a lie? It's not possible. And the biggest one for me, and of course, once again, we're scratching the surface, just giving us some spiritual ammunition. I like that word for this discussion. The disciples is the biggest one for me. These 11 disciples, again, I'll use a pretty heavy word. I'll say the word coward. Now, you may not like that word. But when Jesus was arrested, they scattered. They cared about themselves. But now, now all of a sudden, because something has changed, because something happened, now they're willing to suffer humiliation. Now they're willing to be tormented. Now they're willing even to die for this cause. Out of those disciples, all but one died a martyr's death. And that one, I think I've shared the story recently, that one is John. John, they actually boiled him alive. That's not a good picture, I know. They boiled him alive. He wouldn't die, so they exiled him to an island called Patmos. So if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, if they wouldn't have saw and heard, do you think they would have gone through all those things? Every one of them, do you think they would have gone through that? As a man, I, I hate pain. Sorry, I'm sure men, if you're a guy with me, I'm sure you, I hate pain. I, I, I would last about a half a second before I said, nope, it's not true. These men said, do, do to me what you wish, my Savior. I don't care what you say. He is alive. He is risen. And when, I even, when you kill me, I'm going to open my eyes to Jesus. They were beyond confident, beyond bold that Jesus was alive. Let me ask you a question. How far would you go to keep a lie? How much would you be tortured to keep a lie going? How much pain would you put up with to keep a hoax running? Something you made up. Our passage says if there was no resurrection... Christianity, it probably would have died out with the disciples. It would have faded out with them. But if you look at our world today, time, the date is set because of Jesus, by his birth. You know, there's more books about Jesus than any other topic, any other person. There's a hundred universities in our country, around the world, that were started to spread his teachings. Schools of divinity, schools like Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Now, of course, they've gone a different direction. We don't have time for that sermon, of course. They've gone a different direction since then, but that's how they began, and that's why they began. Jesus is the one who taught that all people are created equal. And by the way, the list goes on and on and on of people, places, things, events, things we see in our world today that are based on the teaching of that book, the Bible, and on our Savior Jesus. So as Christians, if you're here and you're a child of God, if you have a personal walk with him, a talk with him, be encouraged today. Your foundation is unshakable. It's been proven over and over again that we serve a risen God. Amen? And by the, by the way, again, we're scratching the surface. We could go on and on. There's seminary classes that go on for months with more and more and more data than that we have today. 
I love what C.S. Lewis says about it. If you have your bulletin, it's actually written in the front of your bulletin. C.S. Lewis says a perfect quote. He says this. He says, something perfectly new in the history of the universe has happened. Christ has defeated death. The door, which has always been locked, had for the very first time been forced open. There's such overwhelming evidence here. Factual, circumstantial. No intelligent jury would ever, would ever fail to bring a verdict that the resurrection is true. But just in case, to play devil's advocate, just like Paul does, if the resurrection didn't happen, then this book, then the words of Jesus would mean nothing. There'd be no point of us sitting here today. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, our foundation as Christians, it would be gone forever. If it didn't happen, everything would be lost. But ladies and gentlemen, if it did happen, which we kind of already proved it did, then that means Jesus is the one who can answer life's most important questions. All those deep, important questions you have, the answer is found here. The answer is found here at the empty cross. Our passage, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul begins telling us that it's the resurrection that holds our faith together. And then he uses some heavy words. If it didn't happen, then our faith is empty. If it didn't happen, our faith is useless. If it didn't happen, we should be pitied. It's a pretty heavy word, isn't it? But he doesn't leave us hanging, does he? If you jumped ahead, some people do that. I appreciate that. If you jumped ahead, verse 20 actually gives us the answer. Paul doesn't leave us hanging. There's no to be continued here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 20, he says this. After saying all that he said, saying, but if it didn't happen, if it didn't happen, and now all of a sudden, verse 20 says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Hold tight to that verse. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The resurrection is a proven historical fact. It is undeniable. It makes every difference in the world. So when you go to school and they, they teach something called macroevolution, which is a lie, by the way. There's no proof there at all. We don't have time for that sermon. Be like, no, 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 no. They may have big words. They may sound smart. But truth is found right here, ladies and gentlemen. Never believe anything else right here in this words of God. Because Jesus rose from the dead, now you and I, our sins can be forgiven. Jesus made a way, as the song says, where there seems to be no way. We can't do it, only he can. He paid the full price of our sins on that cross when he was our perfect, he was our sinless sacrifice. By his death, by his resurrection, he accomplished what was planned from the very beginning. He connected with Adam divided. So if you're here and you have that personal walk with Jesus, you've accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, you can have a blessed assurance that you can know without a doubt that you are safe in the palm of his hand. And I don't know if there's, a be there, there's no better place to be than safe in the palm of the hand of Jesus. But you can also have something else. Now because Jesus rose from the dead, not only your sins are forgiven, but now your life has purpose. Now your life has purpose. Jesus says in John 10, 10, I come. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Some translation says have it more abundantly. You have purpose in Jesus. That's where true eternal purpose is found. Meaning, purpose is right there with Jesus. You know, we're not random. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship. And the Bible goes on to say, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And we do them because we love Jesus and we're obedient. We're not earning anything, by the way. You do them because, oh, what a glorious Savior we have. It's interesting. Some people, we try to figure out how can we earn salvation? How can I get salvation? So we try to be sincere. There's people you know and I do. As long as we're sincere. Well, let me tell you this. I've been sincerely wrong about a lot of stuff in my life. I don't know about you. You ever been sincerely wrong? You can, be, you can say, you're, well, as long as I'm sincere in what I believe, 
You can be sincere that the sky is red all day long, but when you go out, double check me when you go outside, I think it's going to be blue. Some people think salvation is through good works. Ephesians chapter 2, before I said verse 10 a moment ago, verse 8 and 9, says it is by grace you are saved, through faith. And then he goes out of his way to say, not of works. It's nothing you have done. It's the cross. It's not us. It's not you. We don't boast in us. We boast in him. Some of you were hanging on to heritage. You had an amazing set of grandparents. You did, just like I did. My grandfather, Bible in hand, Wednesday night, Sunday night, Sunday morning, didn't matter. Those doors were open. He was there. Bible just like this. I should have it, still have it in my office. Same Bible. Good, good parents, good grandparents. Some of you had them. What a blessing that was, that you had them. But the walk with Jesus is personal. You can't, ride, you can't hold on to those coattails of mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. No, it's a personal relationship that God wants with you, personally. Some think salvation is through rituals. You've got to say your prayers, take your vitamins, go to church, all good things. But salvation is, again, found through a person. It's not religion. It's a relationship. John chapter 17, 3 says, this is eternal life. And I love what it says next, that they know you. That's it right there. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's interesting. It doesn't say that they know about you. You can know all about God and not know him. That they know him. And man, is that my prayer for every one of us. That we know God, and by the way, then you want more of him, and more of him, and more of him. So again, the question of the day is, what difference does Easter make? What difference does the resurrection make? Because of today, because of the resurrection of Jesus, your sins can be forgiven. You can have meaning. You can have purpose. You can be secure in the arms of your Savior and Creator. But again, the question I have for all of us this morning is have you, personally, have you accepted that free gift? Your parents can't do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. Have you accepted that free gift of salvation? We live in a time of uncertainty. And if you don't agree with that, watch the news tonight, and then you will agree <laughs> that we live in a time of uncertainty. And I wonder, where do you put your faith? D just stop and think through that question. What is your action, not your words, what is your action set of where you put your faith? For, for some of you, you put it in your looks. I get it. It's Easter, right? Look good, get some pictures. I get it. For some of you, it's your stuff. Get your new car out there, new ride out there, new house. Nothing, again, nothing wrong with those things, but that's not where you put your faith. For some of you, it's in the government. Okay, maybe nobody. Maybe nobody does that here. <laughs> I always left that open to see what people would say there. For some of you, it's in your family. You, God has given you such an amazing family. Somebody says, it's such an amazing family God has given you. But again, you don't put your faith there. For some of you, it's your sports, your hobbies. All those things are good things, but all those things I mentioned will one day fade away or they'll let you down. They'll either fade away or let you, and by the way, we will too. Now, don't tell anybody, but we let people down too, don't we? Sadly, I can't think of how many times I've let my own wife down. I can't think of how many times I let my own kids, my family down, just whether something I said, something I did, and you know, you get mad at yourself. But I do it constantly. So I encourage you. I encourage us. I plead and beg you today. If you have never done it, begin today. A relationship with the one who has never let you down. Never let you down. The one who paid it all for you. And by the way, the only one who could pay it all for you. The only one who defeated death for you. Maybe you're here, you're a Christian. You're a child of God. You walk hand in hand with your Savior, and you have stories. You've been through the fire, and he was there. You're Emmanuel, God with us. He was there with you. But I still pray that today is a day of rededication, a day of renewal. Just a reminder, we're not alive to continue to build that savings account. We're not alive to see how many sport trophies we can get on the shelf. 
I beg you, I just beg you to invest in the eternal. Allow me to close with the song I remember singing as a kid. I won't sing it now, don't worry. But the words say this, says, up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph over his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, my Jesus arose. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you thanking you again for this morning, this Easter Sunday, this resurrection day, this day of victory. And it's all from you. It is all because of you. And all worship goes to you. God, please forgive us when we make it about the creation. I'm so good at it. Maybe it's just me. Making it so much about the stuff. We make it about the creation instead of the creator. God, please forgive us. Father, there's one person here who doesn't know you personally. They have all the religion anybody could have, but they don't have a walk with you. They don't talk with you. They don't journey with you. I pray today is the day then they're, that they quit religion and they finally take the hand of you and begin a relationship with the king of all kings. God, we just thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the privilege to worship the only name that deserves worship, and that is yours. Father, we love you, we praise you. It's in your beautiful name that we pray. Amen. This morning we go into a time of invitation. A time of invitation. We're a little old school. If you're first time here, we're a little old school. We have an invitation at the end of our services where it gives you the opportunity to respond, the opportunity to make a decision, which, by the way, the altar is always open. I don't open or close the altar. It's always open. It's not my altar anyway. It's God's. So if you are here and you never said yes to Jesus. You've been chasing maybe the stuff, the money, the ladies, whatever you've been chasing. Whatever you've been chasing, you're like, you know what? I'm done. I'm finally taking hold. I'm clinging to the only one who paid it all for me. The only one who defeated death for me. I pray if you've never done that, today is the day of salvation. The Bible says today is the day. And I pray today you make that decision. In a few hours from now, you're going to maybe be eating a nice meal with family, laughing, eggs, and all that, and it's great. Man, I hope you have a great, I hope every one of us, we have a great day today. But I beg you to not forget what the day is about. All those things you're going to enjoy, it's gifts from Him. It's because of Him. It's from Him. Don't worship the stuff. We're so good at it. Maybe I am. Don't worship the stuff. Worship the only one who deserves worship. So if you've never given your heart, your life to Jesus, I'll be standing right over here. Pastor Cameron's going to be standing right here. It's a privilege. It really would be a privilege to pray with you, pray for you. If you're looking for a church home, we truly are a family. The purpose of this church is to love God and love others. That's our motto. That's our rally cry. That's why we exist. Looking for a church home, we love you to join us. Be a part. We laugh together. And I don't just say these things. I say them every week, I know. But it's not cliche. I really mean it. I really mean that. We truly are family. We truly do laugh. We dive in. We love our, our community. That's a purpose. That's why we're here. So if you're looking for a church home, we encourage you to join us. And if there's anything else, something big going on, something small, it would be a privilege for us to pray for you. So join with me in this morning as we stand and we have our invitation today.